decade through 1951 or, or two when they added up the numbers, followed by the Ten Commandments, which then became the highest grossing film of the 50s, live action. And the last film, uh, Ben-Hur, smothered them all. It, it, uh, it was the top grossing film of the 50s. That, that's quite a record. That's, that's quite a body of work. But then, because it's film, you compete with yourself. Actors really have that, I think, nightmare. Not just the films, but they compete with their own youth. And they, I, I, I think it's difficult, and um, you have to be, uh, you have to have a high level of non-narcissism to be able to live through that. I think Heston had that. A, a lot of people don't know that he played a, an, an increasingly large creative role in his movies. In this film, uh, the script came to him by Arthur Jacobs. Arthur Jacobs was basically a PR guy for uh, one of the studios and uh, had come across this book by Pierre Boulle and wrote a screenplay that uh, he thought for sure would, would get made. Even though he lived in Hollywood, he didn't quite understand that <laughs> nothing gets made when you write a script. But he got it to uh, Charlton Heston. He liked it. He thought, wow, this could be something I could get into and, uh, you know, have some, have a big hit on my hands. But the script was unmakeable. So Heston financed the rewriting of this uh, film by hiring um, Rod Serling from The Twilight Zone. And what Serling did to the film is um, he gave it the Serling touch. And if, if you've seen a lot of those Twilight Zone shows, and if you have, You'll have to get yourself a date uh, to stop watching that television program. But um, uh, there were several episodes in the Twilight Zone that strongly resemble this film. There's one where the pilots crash and they, they think they're on another planet and they all die of starvation. And then the camera pulls back and they're 10 minutes from the 405 movie. Uh, that has a little bit of resonance here. There's one where the girl. Is, uh, uh, is a normal girl, and everybody else is very funny looking, almost like the apes, and uh, they do plastic surgery on her to fix her up. There's some of that in here, and there's one or two others that uh, you can see where Serling fleshed out, to make a pun, this, this film. And finally, uh, when Serling left the project, they brought in Michael Wilson, and this, to me, what I love about uh, uh, film history. Michael Wilson uh, had written a lot of uh, It's a Wonderful Life for Frank Capra in 1946. And um, because of that film all but ended Capra's career, and a little later he was gray-listed, so was, so was Michael Wilson. He was blacklisted. So he wrote a lot of films under the name Pierre Boulle, which was the name that all the blacklisted writers uh, wrote, and one of the films he did was um, Bridge on the River Kwai. Um, and so this was not a guy who just was trying to get by. He's an accomplished screenwriter. And you see that work on the, uh, in, in, the, in the film, but you also see something else, which I want to point out to you. There is a kind of a tribunal in this film, a very one-sided tribunal where they convict um, Charlton Heston for nothing, for being a human being. You know, think about uh, HUAC and uh, the blacklist and what Michael Wilson went through. And this film takes on a little deeper resonance. Um, and it was to Charlton Heston's credit that he hired this writer and uh, led him into, uh, back into the world of filmmaking. Anyway, I have so much more I'd like to Couple of people. Uh, you're in for a, a treat, especially on the big screen. Thank you all for letting me talk to you. Uh, questions?